Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, Doug. Hello. I'm currently driving, so I'm I'm uh, I'll be where I need to be in about five minutes. Okay. Let's see if John and Jeffrey are going to join us. We just did a, a call last night on uh, Sri Aurobindo's book, The Life Divine. We're starting a reading of that, uh, which will last uh, the entire summer, I think, into, into November. And so we did our first session last night. And uh, I had about 80 pages left to read in Soul Mountain, which I didn't get to um, <laughs> before that call. So I thought that I would wake up very early this, this morning and complete it. I set an alarm for 3.30 in the morning. But then um, the girls were disturbed, my daughters and, and, and my wife, and one girl came to the bed and, and the other one came to the bed and, and uh, I didn't get up the way that I wanted to. So I ended up waking up at like 5.30 or, or 6 and, um, and I got some reading done, but then I had an, another call with somebody scheduled for 10 a.m. And then I finally, in the last 30 minutes, read the final 15 pages, but I read them kind mm. of quickly. No. Uh, so I don't feel quite in a peaceful contemplative state with respect to the text. Mm. And I think that I mean, that's unfortunate in a way because the text, this novel really unfolds in a kind of timeless space or a timeless mm. realm kind of dream time, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of experienced it like a dream. Like it's hard for me to really um, visualize everything that happens. I have to go back and remember and I, I don't, my memory is incomplete. Mm -hmm. And as I'm reading, I underline things and I, I go back and I, I read passages that I like and and I try as I'm reading to practice slowing down my attention so that I'm really following um, the details that, that the author is, is offering and also paying attention at, a, at another level to the way that he's contrasting uh, different kinds of experiences or different voices or different interactions that he has with other people or other aspect uh, of himself mm -hmm. and what he's doing as a novelist what he's doing as an artist and also what he's saying about himself uh in relation to the idea of being a, a writer or an artist and the idea of of society uh the the particular culture that that he's in um so it's a very interesting contrast to other kinds of reading and uh, like Sri Aurobindo's philosophy is, I, I'm just getting to, I'm just becoming familiar with it and I'm just starting to, to learn about it. Um, I've only been aware of it or been, um, can comprehended it secondhand and so very superficially, but it's such a different way of, um, constructing the universe i think uh between these authors uh and i might i don't know how much i can really speak concretely about the details of the book and make sense of them apparently the author can't make sense of them either his <laughs> last words is that he understands nothing and mm -hmm. so perhaps the effect is deliberate although i also think that there's a contempt contemplation that is occurring in the book and that to actually mm. read the book Im implies contemplating it or mm. contemplating through it. Uh, and so um, 
perhaps we could engage this conversation as a, a form of contemplation, like a form of remembering and um, piecing together the fragments of what we recall from our reading or what stood out for us, what if there's things that are underlined that we know we can revisit. Perhaps we can stitch together um, our own sort of perspective, our own like conversa- conversation or our own, our own moment of um, contemplation, like hmm. with respect to the, to the book. Um, now that we've read it all, and we've had a couple of conversations too uh, about it. And so yeah. we could build on that mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How are you? Donna? Good. I bought it in Arabic. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Can you see? It's very thick. I was like so very thick. I was so bewildered by this book that I went after I finished it and bought it in Arabic and started reading certain chapters in Arabic because one of the translators is already a, an author. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I mean, I haven't read the background why he decided to translate this book, but he has written a novel also about a journey. So maybe this is what attracted him. Mm -hmm. Uh, What can I say about Soul Mountain? I mean, I finished it this week and I'm still under the spell. Um, Two chapters for me that... I had to read twice and I went back and read them in Arabic, but the English were better translation. Chapter 72 and chapter 52. Chapter 52, when he, co- when he talks about the creation of the I, you, she, and he. Mm. And chapter 72 is when he talks about a novel and fiction. And towards the end, we come out with the idea of the meaning, how to reflect meaning, what is meaning, where is meaning, where can we find meaning. And you can feel in, I think, the last chapters, there were like a chapter when he just lists words without a meaning. And this is immediately took me to Samuel Beckett. I don't know if you have read one of his short stories. I think it was uh, Bing. Think, and it was meaningless mm-hmm. and it's it it's immediately took me to that and to the idea of when we write do we look for meaning or is it meaning for me because you know towards the end of the chapters there was this meeting with another novelist who wanted to give him the traditional meaning the meaning we might see in our life, in reality, that we think it is reality. But he told him that, no, he cannot send this book for publishing. And we have in 72 his argument with a critic about what is a novel and what is a meaning. And when he was telling him, uh, this is not a novel, what you are uh, writing, maybe he was referring to Soul Mountain. And he was telling him, these are only excerpts, these are only experiences, these are only things. You are maybe like a a piece of paper here, a piece of paper there, and then you're telling me this is a novel. And then for me, this is a novel. This is definitely a a revolution in literature, a revolution in a novel writing. Uh, Each chapter for me was a complete novel by itself. I didn't have to go and look for a plot, for an action, what is going to happen next. This is not what I want. This book is telling me there is meaning in every chapter. There is meaning in every word. And sometimes there is no meaning. Because life, evidently, when he faced the end of this novel, should he comprehend meaning? He comprehend nothing. And he was always trying to say... Should I create or not to create, exist or not to exist? And there was this meeting with this lady who told him to to write a story about a character, a friend of hers. And then he was like, no, I don't want to. Don't give me facts. I don't want to write write about facts. I mean, it's, it's amazing, this book. I mean, I was like feeling I'm part of his experience. I'm part of his... I mean, this is the way I write. Maybe that's why I felt so attached to him. I was like, finally, because once I sent something 
to someone to publish something. And I was told the same thing what the critic told him. This is not, it's meaningless. Okay, it's nice. You have something there, but it's not connected. It's meaningless. And then I was like, yeah, but I mean, this is how I write. This is how I see existence. This this is how I see meaning. For me, I don't know. I mean, amazing. This novel for me, it was amazing. I have to say an amazing experience, an amazing learn of the self. And you remember we were discussing who is you and who is she and who is he. How would I know myself without creating a you, a he and she? I felt I need to create a he, then I created a she. Then you get to know yourself from the others. Mm. And I mean, there is so much to talk about. And as you said, yeah, maybe we should do more and more and go back to certain chapters. And there's so much. It's not just philosophy. It's more of art, you know. And I don't know. I, I For me, this is a beautiful novel. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you found a copy in Arabic. That, yeah, I did. That probably helped things out a bit there. Um, yeah, what you just said is is beautiful in itself. It's a, its own chapter, but I've which my whole life it's exactly what you're saying, and even more so this past month, I've really tapped into what exactly what he's getting at at the end. That I, I we don't understand anything, um, even our own language then bringing that out to the Chinese language, then bringing that to his interpretation and reforming of the Chinese language, which we we can't even, we might be able to look at it, but it's still a foreign entity to us. And that that's how we describe our experience. So I'm, that's a, he's, he's getting at something that we, we, we cannot comprehend all too much. And once we do, which, and, w- and once you kind of tap into that, you notice it more and more. You notice kind of the the boundary line you can walk to where you're either in the mundane or the, the sacred, the spiritual realm. And um, I, I guess going, I, I lost the momentum of this novel after the first session, I, I really, really, really got into the first seven chapters. Um, I'm not a musician, but I have a program where I can make music um, electronically or record the voice or an instrument. And I, I did a few couple completely unfinished songs that I'd rather not post to the, the website or something like that. But uh, I, I felt exactly what was needing to be felt. Um, And I I lost that momentum, just simply there's a lot going on in my life. And uh, I I spent the last week trying to get back into that momentum. And I'm glad you you said something as you have now. Uh, That makes me want to say, well, even though if we're done with this this reading here, I do want to kind of go back to that point where I did lose the momentum. Um, The relationship between him and her or she and he or she and I or whatever uh, really kind of distracted me. And it wasn't until the end I realized at least a few connections for me that it, maybe it's that primal, the sexual is not necessarily just a mundane relationship. It's that primal connection to the drive, um, which I didn't pick it out when I was reading it. Now that I've kind of toggled on to the end, I, I, I want to go back and understand it more. The only other thought I have at this moment, which goes back to the songs that I I said I make, I that the past four or five years I've been producing these songs. They're they're sketches. They're not defining my life in any way, but they define a moment. And I did go back and reflect on everything I produced. And it really tells a story. Uh, And in the same sense, I imagine, I I can't remember how many years, maybe six or seven years he was doing this, that he he probably had possibly a thousand 
<laughs> or more chapters that he produced. And each one starts from a place and then it reaches into a new zone. And I'll stop there with the end. I, <laughs> I lost my thought. <laughs> Um, I, I think that there's a kind of very loose story here. Um, not in the sense of there being a plot with the beginning, middle, and end, and an arc, a narrative arc, mm -hmm. tension, climax, resolution, like that, those mm -hmm. conventional narrative mm -hmm. forms, which is what that critic that Donna referred to is representing. Uh, but there is the movement of an individual person, an individual soul out of society, like out of a, out of a, a out of a embeddedness in a relationship with, with you know, so like with the world, he sometimes talks about it and, and there's a, he talks a number of times, about the relationship between being in the world and re being a recluse from the world, like the wild man, the Taoist mm. monks, yeah. the Buddhist uh, monks, all of these uh, people who don't participate in, in the world that he's, that he's fleeing from. And, then, and that world is connected to these historical movements, the Cultural Revolution, various other, you know, um, historical moments, different dynasties and uh, phases of the empire of, you know, and the, the nation of China. But he's always insisting on the point of view of himself as the, as the, the being who is, have, who is, expe who is having a, a, an experience. And, and he moves out of the, the um, that social realm, that, that conventional realm, and, and, and begins following a winding path through, his, through the history of the, the whole region, not just the official national history, but the ancient history, mm -hmm. the fragments and the remnants that have in some way survived the process of cultural revolution, the, the, the process of, of um, war, and um, various kind of movements of power. There's all these different forces, the bandits, mm. for example, the warlords, uh, and also tribal like uh, mm. differences. Uh, and mm. Moving kind of outside of the Han, you know, Chinese sort of homogenized identity into all of these more fragmentary, but surviving rep like repositories of deep meaning. So, the, the Taoist priests in the temple, like on the mountain that, that he finds his, his way to and the various encounters that, the, that, that he has, um, he's always looking for uh, that, that surviving remnant of culture and that some surviving remnant of, of human expression. But it, it's not a, um, a, a humanitarian or a... a kind of humanist uh, project that he has. Uh, I don't think he's, um, you know, he's not trying to recreate a, a, a national tradition or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There was a pro project in the United States um, where uh, a man and a small team went and found all the recordings of old blues guitarists and um, folk uh, artists from the Appalachian region, the South, different parts of the United States and did field recordings and, and tried to you know, preserve them. They, they created a website. Um, documentary, a documentarian uh, who works in the United States um, and with American history, Ken Burns, does that with archival footage and with uh, interviewing you know, people that were associated with different moments in American history, like Vietnam, World War II, the Civil War. But there's an attempt there to create a a sort of uh, an identity to, to, to enrich a national identity. This is what it means to be American. This is what it means uh, to be uh, a member of a particular community, um, a cultural community or ethnic community uh, and some identity. 
what I think is, to me, that most um, poignant about Gao uh, Jingjiang's novel is how radically individual it is. Uh, he refuses to speak on behalf of any other or for or through any other uh, identity or, or, or organization or, or, or being. Uh, he's, and even, even, and, and even his individuality is so radical that it deconstructs his own sa- self. There's not an I at the center of the individuality. Like you were saying, Donna, hmm. the individual re- requires or unfolds, discovers itself, enga- en- engages who it, it is through the, the you and then through the he. And, and he says some interesting things about how those uh, points of view become manifested. Um, it's in chapter 52. And I, I, I didn't go through like Jeffrey did last time and make notes for every single mm-hmm. chapter. But in a few chapters when there was a particular theme that um, stood out for me, I, I wrote it down. And so this one, 52, uh, I, 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 would, I, I feel like I'm like, let's just go in and read a little bit. And mm. uh, because this one to me was like a key to understanding his whole way of, of writing. Mm. Um, you have it in Arabic, right? Yeah, I have it in Arabic. <laughs> but, you I know, have... yeah, you want me to read a little bit in Arabic? It would be interesting. Sure. <laughs> Like one sentence to hear the language. <laughs> okay, let me see. 52, yes. تعرف أنني لا أفعل شيئا سوى التحدث إلى نفسي لكي أتسلى في وحدتي. تعرف أن وحدتي لا شفاع منها. لا أحد يستطيع مؤاساتي ولا يسعني إلا أن أسأل من ذاتي ذات أخرى أخاطبها. Yes. Now English. <laughs> Was that the first paragraph? Yes. You know that I'm just talking to myself to alleviate my loneliness. You know that this loneliness of mine is incurable, that no one can save me, and that I can only talk with myself as the partner of my conversation. That was loneliness, you know, and even loneliness, sorry to, to interrupt you. He said that he writes because of loneliness. He writes his fiction because of loneliness in 72. Hmm. I mean, this... Writing is an activity that you do by yourself. You do not engage others in it. And loneliness definitely is in writing. When you write, you write alone. So this sense of loneliness, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was like, sometimes I I too write out of loneliness. So for me, when I've read it, this, I have to say, I was very emotional when I read 52. I think writing creates loneliness too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, could we read on? Because yes, there's there's the one, two, three, four, where he goes all the way through uh, how you and she are born, mm-hmm. and um, I liked alternating. <laughs> Can we? Do you, would you want to read it in Arabic and then? Why not read in English? Would be interesting. Okay. Uh, what if we do one paragraph at a time? Okay. Should I f- go for Arabic for yes. second paragraph? Yes. Okay. It's and and to make sure it's one sentence, right? Okay. Okay. Exactly. I'm gonna read till till shadow till my shadow. Okay. All right. في هذه المناجات الطويلة أنت هو موضوع سرتي. وفي الواقع إنها إحدى التجليات الذاتية التي تزغي إلي بانتباه أنت لست سوى ظلي. In this lengthy soliloquy, you are the object of what I relate. A myself who listens intently to me. You are simply my shadow. وفيما كنت أصغي بانتباه إلى أنت خاصتي 
جعلتك تخلقي هي لأنك مثلي لا تستطيع احتمال الوحدة وعليك أن تجدي أيضا أحدا تتحدث إليه As I listen to myself and you, I let you create a she, because you are like me and also cannot bear the lonely, loneliness and have to find a partner for your conversation. لجأت إذا إلى هي تماما كما لجأت إلى أنت. هي مشتقة من أنت وبالمقابل تؤكد أنا. That was a long sentence. Uh, those, <laughs> so both of them. I've read two sentences, actually. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So you talk with her just like I talk with you. She was born of you, yet is an affirmation of myself. Shall we do one more? This is the last one. We'll do it. أنت شريك حواراتي حولت تجربتي وخيالي إلى صلات بين أنت وهي دون أن يكون في المستطاع التمييز بين ما ينبو عن الخيال وما ينبو عن التجربة. You who are the partner of my conversation, transform my experiences and imagination into your relationship with her. And it is impossible to disentangle imagination from experience. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I wish we could have a Chinese version as well. Oh, yeah, that would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. And we have a he. The he comes yeah. later. Also, the we. Yeah. Mm. But, but he refuses the we. He does. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't want a we. Like he doesn't want society, he doesn't want history. He talks about history somewhere. You've read the part about history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, culture, history. I mean, in my opinion, the Taoist and the experience of the Taoist, I felt that he was trying to look for meaning in everywhere, in love, in relations, the relation with a woman, having a baby, having a family, having ideology. Um, having being part of a family, of a, a society, of even having a job every time. And then he, he introduces himself, someone different, doing different job. Looking for meaning, what is interesting is that the last chapter, even God, when he was speaking, he was speaking without meaning. And even God was a frog without a meaning. So this is for me was amazing. I mean, even if he went to the Taoist to find meaning, he didn't find meaning there. Even if he went through the country, if he went to different people, people with education, without education, villagers, uh, people with uh, certain strength, with opinions, looking meaning everywhere, until he reached the frog, the god frog, and even their meaning was not there. So we go back to, there's no meaning. Then why should I write a meaning, meaningful novel? Hmm. What do you think? What does he think? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's now us, the death of the author. It's now the reader. <laughs> As an outside I didn't just read as you two did but as a listener which this didn't come to me the first time around I read this chapter um, but it's almost like the creation myth in a way um, it's it could I, I, I read it as this is God creating Adam and Adam and Eve in a certain sense um, also the uh, what what is the chart he mentioned maybe the Taiji chart, um, but there's there's the nothingness, and there's the one line and the two, so that's then it eventually reaches what he's talking about. Then it expands, and that that's the formation of language. Um, what our friend Ed had a discussion on Genesis. Um, I don't know if you've met him, or he was part of the the bubbles group there at one point, but that that's what 
this is reminding me of right now, just as a an outside listener. Uh, so I definitely want to go back and listen to it again. You, you two could read uh, the rest of the chapter if you feel like it. <laughs> he also did write, it, it's in the same Case for Literature book. I found it at my library too, but at the, the very last essay that he has is called The Necessity of Loneliness. I don't know if either one of you read that, but um, the first sentence is the feeling of loneliness is unique to humans. A tree or a bird may seem to be lonely, but this is an attribute bestowed by the person making the observation. The tree or the bird is incapable of perceiving loneliness. Um, um, I don't need to go on there, but um, so it is a human attribute. I, I, I have a I question that though. I, I wonder if it's a, I wonder how much of it is a modern kind of attribute or something that like modern people experience in a particular way. In the uh, same way that maybe trauma is experienced, like an animal might seem like it's, I, um, I, don't, I, I talked well, to yeah. somebody about this yeah, previously. Like the modern trauma, the modern trauma is this displacement, it's cultural destruction, it's the, you know, the, 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 almost the diminution of the human in the face of an overwhelming force or power. Uh, for uh, Xinjiang, it's, it's the state, I think. This comes again and again. Uh, it's not only the Chinese communist government because that is arising out of mm. millennia of... Uh, of attempts to control the human, but the human becomes, I think in, in the modern sense, like I, I read a very similar voice here to like Kafka where uh, one is so like radically alienated and so radically diminished, you know, by the, um, the overwhelming, uh, you know, reality of, of what the world has become uh, that it opens into a whole nother aesthetic almost it, it like on the other side, on the other side of that meaninglessness, there's another kind of artistic movement that occurs. And I, th I think it's particular. It's what I, I don't want to be too theoretical and debate whether it's modern or non-modern. Mm. There's a, you know, various kinds of thinking that, around that. But I, I have to also read this in relation to a uh, tradition, like a literary tradition. Uh, something about, like we were saying, like there's a loneliness, but then the writing also makes you more lonely and reading makes you more lonely in another way. And it creates this soul space where you can't relate to the conventional world in the way that everybody else does, except those who are also reading or also having anomalous experiences and are not really following the, the rules because it's always about people following certain rules. And he's always questioning why those rules are. I mean, maybe he doesn't, he's not really trying to mount some kind of protest. I think he, he uh, has, he feels a futility in that. Uh, he doesn't, he's not even trying to, he's not trying to fight it. Uh, he also has an essay in the case for literature called uh, On Fleeing, uh, something like that, or The Writer as in Exile, something, I don't have the title in front of me, but he really has made a choice in, in his life not to fight it, to ra rather, better to go, to leave uh, and continue doing what he likes to do it seems that what he really loves to do is to is to write and to create art uh and and to wander to experience life itself better that than to maybe waste one's one's energies trying to change something that is not going to change there's something very pessimistic i think in in this view but it's also particular to 
his life. Uh, it seems that he was born into war. Uh, he talks about his mother at one point who gave birth to him while the Japanese were bombing uh, the countryside. Uh, his parents both died uh, in, you know, violent, in, I forgot the exact circumstances, but in his, his family is all decimated, you know, by war. Everywhere he goes uh, is this, you know, totalitarian state, uh, the bureaucratic state uh, that um, he has to navigate and kind of feign his way through. He has to use his identification card from the Writers Association, from, from the party to, you know, pretend that he's doing research or whatever it is. And then, and then he has a certain role in that whole world, that, which comes at the end of the book, where he starts, you have more, we have more frequent chapters uh, that are happening in like an urban place. Like his friends are visiting him. He seems to be back in Shanghai, perhaps. Is that, mm. is that where he mm. is? He's traveling between Shanghai and uh, Beijing. Mm. Uh, and, and then, you know, they're all, they all have their agendas. Uh, the editor has his agenda. The, you know, his friends have certain agendas. Um, other writers, uh, it's, you can see why he, he's just so fed up. He gets more angry and he almost exposes people as, you know, kind of for their, stupidity or for their cruelty uh like he had his disgust with with the woman who wanted him to tell her friend's story mm -hmm. uh and how he got food poisoning from her. <laughs> yeah. but, um i i don't i i don't know what to make of it really because uh it feels like so sad <laughs> it feels like such a sad <laughs> path uh and um you know, I, I, I hope that, I mean, he left, he didn't finish, he finished this book in, in France and mm -hmm. he established himself there and, you know, became very successful, of course. Uh, but that, that isn't part of this book. All, everything that happened after this book, uh, it seemed like this is a man who had no hope at, uh, whatsoever uh, other than for his immediate experience and for the ability to, create something out of it uh and to to experience his own soul like to through the through his creation um but I, yeah i i feel lonely too when i read it <laughs> and, I, and i feel that wow maybe that's actually maybe what's driving me sometimes as well and uh i try to deny that of course and i try to flee from the loneliness in various ways but um, it seems to be a core of the experience. Maybe by, you know, we can relate. Uh, we can be the I, we can be the you in, in here. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not limited to his character, Gao Zhijing, as a personage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, insofar as we can occupy the space of that contemplative eye, that frog's eye uh, uh, view, uh, it does, I don't know if it's sort of, I don't know if that lessens the loneliness or not. I think maybe it doesn't actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is so much to, to, to look at and comprehend. I'm just going through chapters there was this scene when i felt him i think he was in the woods and when he darkness was everywhere and he used the lighter and then the stick to try to find his way and this is like the 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 greatest moment of being an existentialist there individual with no help being blind darkness don't know your way left alone with no help nothingness i mean this scene i can't remember which chapter but when i've read it i mean how worse it can get you know it seemed to me like he almost could have died a few times in the, in the course of his yeah <laughs> uh, he seemed to yeah. get lost on mountains and seemed to yeah 
mm. the truck driver that mm. uh, he tried to get a ride from and sort of deceived him mm. with his papers and, and then kicked him mm. out of the truck at the, at the, at the fort. Mm. Uh, it seemed like he was on the verge of, you know, getting assaulted or something. Yeah. Um, and then some imaginary, I think, or dreamed maybe uh, encounters like the one with the stone, s- stone, mm. name? stone man. Or no, the stone man. Yes. I, I, um, I think something like that. Yeah. And there was the, the hunter, I mean, at the beginning of the novel, we learn that the hunter is dead. And then towards the end, he goes back and see his his cabin, I think, or his cave. And he speaks to the hunter. And then he's afraid of touching his body. And then he takes the rifle and the rifle, you know, becomes like ashes. And at the beginning, he was looking for this hunter. He wanted him to, he was asking around, I mean, maybe chapter two or chapter three. I can't remember where. What was him? Papa something? Big Papa? Or... Was it Grandpa Stone? Grandpa. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or the bear fat. The yeah. Rest. Towards the end, he takes us back to him and where he met him. And, yeah. That had a very and, funny ending. That yeah. Time, by the way. He, he was dead and he was talking to a dead person. and Yeah, and it had a funny ending. Hey, Doug, uh, could I propose a, another little reading experiment? This might be more fun. Yeah. Uh, so this is the last paragraph of chapter 68. Okay. Would you want to read that, Doug? <laughs> and like maybe our Arabic, English. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Starts with your soul, please. Right. But let's maybe let's do English first. Mm. Then the Arabic. Then like you'll listen for something different in the Arabic I mm. bet, after you hear it in English. And I can't even imagine what it's like in Chinese. <laughs> your soul flees through the orifices of your body and you see countless toads with their big mouths gaping at the sky. They are like a flock of headless tiny people with arms overstretched to the ore sky, calling out in despair, give my head back, give my head back, give my head back, give my head, give back my head, give back my head, give back my head, my head, give it back, my head, give it back, my head, give it back, give me back my head, give me back my head. My head, give it back to me. My head, give it back to me. Give back my head to me. Give back my head to me. To me, give back my head. My head to me, give back. Give back to me my head. To me, give back my head. عند إذن فارقتك روحك ولم تعد ترى إلا ضفادع لا تحصى. ملتفة نحو السماء مثل حجد من الرجال القصار الذين قطعت رؤوسهم وهم يرفعون أيديهم نحو السماء صارخين بكل ما في حناجرهم من بأس أعيد لي رأسي أعيد لي رأسي أعيد لنا رؤوسنا أعيد لنا رؤوسنا رؤوسنا أعيدوها لنا رؤوسنا أعيدوها لنا رؤوسنا أعيدوها لنا نحن أعيد لنا رؤوسنا رؤوسنا أعيد لنا نحن رؤوسنا أعيد لنا نحن هيا أعيد لنا رؤوسنا أعيد رأس أنا I did not read this the first time around that was one part that I probably skipped over interesting yeah, there are all these little yeah. nuggets like that. Um, he gets playful like that in places. Uh, That's definitely a performance piece, I think. Part of maybe one of his plays. It's kind of sort of absurdist uh, theater. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, 
Why don't we look at chapter 72? Because that was the other one mm. that you mentioned. And mm. I also made a note of that. It seemed to me, like you, like you said earlier, that in a way the novel is composed of an, all, all, all these micro-novels. Like mm. Each of the chapters is a sort of novel in itself. Uh, and 81 chapters. I thought this was a... Uh, an example of a metafictional novel. That's what I. That's what I wrote down in my notes. Uh, like a novel about a novel. Mm. Um, I, and this is pretty short. It's like one, two, three, four. <laughs> and this was another mm. funny one as well. Mm. Um, I don't know. Do, could we like? Can we stage this like right now, like a flash theater? <laughs> of uh, maybe we should do it in English, though. Yeah. Just to kind of move through it, it's not as like poetic as uh, some of the. Yeah. Uh, so how about I play the editor? <laughs> how many voices are here? There's the editor. I think two voices, or maybe okay. two, three. Um, I just want to do a quick audio check. I, I have lots of wind and I'm outdoors, so I didn't want to have a distracting muffled sound. Uh, just wanted to check on that. You if I leave okay. my mute off. Okay. Right now. They're, they're actually, there's like a little tit, 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 a little sound. That's probably the book flapping in the wind. <laughs> Is that better? Okay, so I, 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 we'll just kind of take turns. How about with the lines, but I'll try, I'll try to be consistent on my line. This isn't a novel. Then what is it? A novel must have a complete story. He said he has told many stories, some with endings and others without. They're all fragments without any sequence. The author doesn't know how to organize connected episodes. Then may I ask how a novel is supposed to be organized? Uh, you must first foreshadow, build to a climax, then have a conclusion. That's basic common knowledge for, fic for writing fiction. He asks if fiction can be written without conforming to the method which is common knowledge. It would just be like a story with parts told from beginning to end and parts from end to beginning, parts with a beginning and no ending, and others which are only conclusions or fragments which aren't followed up, parts which are developed but aren't completed, or which can't be completed, or which can be left out, or which don't need to be told any further, or about which there's nothing more to say. And all of these would also be considered stories. All right, so this is the editor again. Mm. Uh, no matter how you tell the story, there must be a protagonist. In a long work of fiction, there must be several important characters. But this work of yours? But surely the I, you, she, and he in the book are characters? He asked. How about this? Donna, <laughs> you actually do what's inside the quotations. Mm. And then you're like the narrator. Doug, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. These are just different pronouns. No, that's my, oh, that, that would be my line. That's your line. <laughs> yes. So these are just different. The, I'm the editor. Let me. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I'll be kind of the ig ignoramus editor mm -hmm. here. It doesn't get modern fiction. These are just different pronouns to change the point of view of the narrative. This can't replace the portrayal of characters. These pronouns of yours, even if they are characters, don't have clear images. They're hardly described at all. He says he isn't painting portraits. Right. Fiction isn't painting. It is art and language. Do you really think that petulant exchanges between these pronouns can replace the creation of the personalities of the characters? He says he doesn't want to create the personalities of the characters. And what's more, he doesn't know if he himself has a personality. Why are you writing fiction if you don't even understand what fiction is? He then asks politely for a definition of fiction. 
the critic, the critic is, is cowed. cowed and snarls. <laughs> this is modernist. Ah, that's what I just said. <laughs> He's imitating the West, but falling short. He says, then, it's Eastern. This is the critic. Uh, yours is much worse than Eastern. <laughs> You've slapped together travel notes, moralistic ramblings, feelings, notes, jottings, untheoretical discussions, unfable-like fables, copied out some folk songs, added some legend-like nonsense of your own invention, and are calling it fiction. He says the gazetteers of the warring state period, the record of humans and strange events of the former and later Han, the Wei and Jin, and the southern and northern dynasties, the Chonqi romances of the Tang dynasty, the prompt books of the Song dynasty, the episodic novels and bells letters of the Ming and Qing dynasty, as well as the writings through the ages on geography and the natural sciences, street talk, morality tales, and the miscellaneous record of strange events are all acknowledged as fiction. But none of these have ever had any fixed models. Are you from the searching for roots school? He hastens to say, you, sir, have stuck such labels on him. However, the fiction he writes is simply because he can't bear the loneliness. He writes to amuse himself. He didn't expect to fall into the quagmire of the literary world, and at present he is trying to pull himself out. He didn't write these books in order to eat. Fiction for him is a luxury beyond earning money and making a livelihood. You're a nihilist. He says he actually has no ideology, but does have a small amount of nihilism in him. However, nihilism isn't the equivalent of absolute nothing nothingness. It's just like in the book where you is the reflection of I and he is the back of you, the shadow of a shadow. Although there's no face, it still counts as a pronoun. The critic shrug, shrugs his shoulders and departs. He feels confused and uncertain about what it is that is critical in fiction. Is there the narrative or is it the mode of narration? Or is it not the mode of narration, but the attitude of the narration? Or is it not the attitude of the, but the affirmation of an attitude? Or is it not the affirmation of an attitude, but the affirmation of the starting point of an attitude? Or is it not the starting point, but the self, which is the starting point? Or is it not the self, but perception and awareness of the self? Or is it not the perception and awareness of the self, but the process of that perception and awareness? Or is it not the process, but the action itself? Or is it not the action itself, but the possibility of the action? Or is it not the possibility, but the choice of action? Or is it not whether there is a choice, but whether there is the necessity of a choice? Or is it not in the necessity, but in the language? Or is it not in the language, but whether the language is interesting? Nevertheless, he is intrigued with using language to talk about women, about men, about love, about sex, about life, about death, about the ecstasy and agony of the soul and the flesh and about people's solicitousness for people and politics, about people evading politics, about the inability to evade reality, about unreal imagination, about what is more real, about the denial of utilitarian goals is not the same as an affirmation of it about the illogic of logic, but rational reflection, greatly surpassing science in the dispute between content and form, about meaningful image, images and meaningless content, about the definition of meaning, about everyone wanting to be God, about the worship of idols by atheists, about self-worship, about dubbed philosophy, about self-love, about indifference to sex transforming into megalomania. Mania, about schizophrenia, about sitting in Chan contemplation, about sitting not in Chan contemplation, about meditation, about the way of nurturing the body. It's not the way about an effability or ineffability, but the absolute necessity of the eff for the effability of the way about fashion, about revolt against vulgarity is a mighty smash with the racket, about a fatal blow with a club and Buddhist enlightenment about children must not be taught about those who teach First, being taught about drinking a belly full of ink, about going black from being close to ink, about what is bad, about being black, about good people, about bad people, about bad people are not people, about humans by nature are more ferocious than wolves, 
about the most wicked are other people and hell, in fact, is in one's own mind, about bringing anxieties upon oneself about nirvana, about completion, about completion, is nothing completed, about what is right, about what is wrong, about the creation of grammatical structures, about not yet saying something is not the same as not saying anything about talk is useless in functional discourse about no one is the winner in battles between men and women about moving pieces backwards and forwards in a game of chess curbs the emotions which are the basis of human nature about human beings need to eat about starving to death is a trifling affair whereas loss of integrity is a major event but that it is impossible to arbitrate this as truth about the fallibility of experience, which is only a crutch about falling if one has to fall about revolutionary fiction, which smashes superstitious belief in literature about a revolution in fiction, about revolutionizing fiction. Reading this chapter is optional, but as you've read it, you've read it. The longest sentence ever. <laughs> David Foster Wallace has some uh, competitive uh, length sentences in, in Infinite Jest. Uh, um, but this, this is, is definitely... before that novel, correct? It is. Before Infinite actually. Jest. It is, actually. Um, mm. And, uh, but this is definitely, um, I think there's, in, in uh, Ulysses, there's, there's, the or Finnegan's Wake, there must be some some sentences that get potentially this long. I'm not sure. There's um, a movie called Adaptation. I don't know if anybody has heard of that, but Charlie Kaufman is the or maybe the Kaufman brothers. Uh, mm. They did being John Malkovich. Um, but Adaptation starts out with this writer speaking into a recorder, which you don't see anything. It's a blank screen of him just rambling on and on and on. And that, yeah, that's what it reminds me of. And <laughs> it's about everything and about nothing, that type of thing. <laughs> there's at one point where there is a recorder, uh, and and I and I I remember him saying that he writes by recording himself speaking, or that was one of the methods that he used with this novel, because he wanted to uh, really bring forth the sensuality of the language. He wanted to make sure that the Chinese that he was using um, wasn't the sort of sanitized, Western-friendly uh, version of Chinese that uh, he you know, claim, claims has become predominant uh, in, uh, in, more, in recent time. Um, and, and, so, and then there's actually one passage, and it's similar to this, where it's sort of like a s stream of consciousness. But at the very end of it, he perceives and notes the recorder with the red light blinking. Uh, and so I wonder if this came out just like that as a outpouring of uh, like uh, of, of the, the whole cascade, you know, of things that are in this novel. I mean, it's basically an inventory. It's like a laundry list of everything you would find in the novel. And so, and a sort of also, uh, uh, almost a manifesto in a way <laughs> of, of a you know approach to writing or of what writing means to him like what what it means to 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 spill your soul uh into a book mm. yeah. i thought this, Donna, you were sorry no go ahead well you I, were saying earlier about what this book meant to you and like that you felt it was, you know, revolution is a strong word, but that as a work of fiction, it um, has a, that kind of quality. Like a, it's, a, it's, it's something like radically unique. Uh, mm. I wonder this might relate to that, uh, that thought you had earlier. Mm. Uh, yeah, but but you know, when we were reading now this chapter uh, seventy-two, I thought if 
like our conversation now, and you mentioned the recording, and we are recording a conversation. And let's say we decided to do chapter 82. What do you think of our conversation added? Do you think that, I mean, it would fit perfectly because this novel is segments. And if we put our conversation as 82, it would be part of this universe within it. Right. There, there are 81 it, chapters in this book that I have here. Uh, <laughs> would be our conversation, chapter 82. I, I, I like that idea. Um, it would be, I mean, why not? That is uh, I, you, and he, and we can create a she out of necessity. And then write chapter 82. I mean, when we were reading, I thought recording, and you mentioned recording, we can easily write chapter 82. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll have to get into a fight or something. And, yeah. yeah. Let's not go a little bit later. Yeah, threatened suicide, or, threatened. Uh, or a dream, a state of dream. I, I do have the uh, the perfect clouds right now or the perfect setting for this. I'm, I'm on top of a big hill. This is my yeah Kentucky mountain here. <laughs> and there is a mountain. <laughs> I'm also wondering, as just some random comment, but... Um, it was written from 1982 until 1989, so maybe 81. Maybe it's just that's how he decided the structure, possibly. Huh? Well, 1982 yeah. is when it began, so this is the ending. But just a, a silly Not note, which I'm numbers. sure it crossed his mind. You mean the significance of there being 81 yeah. chapters? Yeah. So mm -hmm. 82 would be actually his starting of the journey. So. Oh, mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Mm. it's just another kind of mm. optional comment there <laughs> there's a line uh, that I underlined in, in 72 um, which I thought of all that stream of consciousness mm. this one uh, rang out for me as saying something that I needed to hear uh, about so this, I'll, I'll read like the line right before it just to give it context so about nirvana about completion about completion is nothing completed about what is right about what is wrong about the creation of grammatical structures about not yet saying something is not the same as not saying anything and I felt that um, like sometimes you're working your way towards saying something like you don't yet know how to say what you want to say and yet you have to speak. And mm -hmm. the speaking or the writing or whatever form that communication takes is necessarily partial. But it's not, and it's necessarily even erroneous. It's not right. It's not the thing that you want to say. But, you, but it's not not saying the thing that you want to say because it's on the way to saying it. And by uttering it or recording it, you bring yourself a step closer to that thing itself. Now, uh, that thing is elusive, of course. Like, that's sort of the soul mountain that is on the other side of the river, and there's this kind of confusion. Which side of the river is it mm. on? Uh, Wu Yizhen is on that side, but he came from Wu Yizhen. The venerable elder is telling him that to go back to the, the other side. Uh, he, it, and as soon as you get close to the soul mountain, everything gets kind of crazy and dark mm -hmm. and lost and you meet wild men and like it's very hard to actually get to the thing that you mm. want to say um but i, I appreciated this because uh it val values the fragmentary it values the partial uh it values the the, um, the journey like for for not to be cliche about it but uh, there was also this connection to Aurobindo, uh, which I'm just noticing. I, I read the first chapter for the other reading group, The Life Divine, and he's describing, or actually, I may have read this someplace else. It was maybe in a, a paper about Aurobindo's levels of consciousness because he posits that the mind is just the 
kind of start, you know, starting level for, for humans and that beyond the mind or mental consciousness in Gebser's uh, terms, which uh, um, I think, did you read Gebser with us, Donna? Jean Gebser? No. No? Oh, okay. No. Um, but beyond the mental, uh, for in Aurobindo, he says that there's a higher mind and then an illumined mind and then intuitive mind and then an overmind and then supermind and supermind is mm. the mind of God. And then ultimate reality is what he calls Satchitananda, which is being consciousness and bliss or being and knowledge and ecstasy or different translations of that. Um, but, uh, the 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 um like the diff the kind of higher mind the intuitive they they speak through the low sometimes the 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 mind or the 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 lower structures and high in in our bindo it's a hierarchical uh sequence you know of how reality mm. unfolds it sort of becomes from pure spiritual pure spirit mm. becomes matter through like um, involution and involution or an infolding process and then through evolution and mm. through the process of world formation it beca- it comes to awaken as spirit itself but anyway that, that's not just in Aurobindo that's in also German idealism and you know, goes back Plotinus uh, mm. and, and you know has history in Vedanta and also in Gnostic, uh, Western Gnosticism but what was my point? There was a, the, the connection, like there, there was a, there was a part, part where he says that that everything the supermind does is true. Even the fragments on the way to saying what it is, what it is the, the, of, that is ultimate truth, that is truth consciousness itself is true. Even the mm-hmm. pieces that don't say it all, because they're part of this unfolding this process of revelation are true. Mm. And uh, although they're almost like two completely different people and thinkers and ways of seeing the world, like our, our Bindo and, and the more transcendental kind of spiritual orientation mm. is, uh, you know, has a certain, has a kind of orientation toward light and clarity. Mm. Uh, and the, the, and uh, the fiction writer in the in the way that Gao in the way that Gao Jingjiang is doesn't like refuses that in a way. Mm. The, uh, re- reality doesn't have. He never talks about the super mind or God is a frog. Isn't that not <laughs> a transcendental idea? Mm. Mm. Uh, and and so I. I wonder, I, I've been, like, because we're, I'm coming from that conversation last night and the reading I was doing, preparing for that talk, and then into this space, mm. how are those related to each other? Like, it's almost jarring to, to move from this great metaphysical grand narrative mm. Mm. to the the kinds of um, what Aaron, Ma- uh, another book that re- philosopher mm. we've been reading named Aaron Manning mm. calls the minor gesture which mm. is like in music, you have major chords um, and then mm. the more the, the darker keys, which give different intonations and complexities to the, mm. to the major movements. But it seems like, like the unity of those two mm. is, is in the particular, like that is, realizes its truth without surrendering its particularity w- without submitting its particularity or like there's a sort of a absolute authority to that frog mm. without it um of course from a mental perspective it's just a frog right it's a one example of countless mm. other frogs and countless other amphibians and uh you know biological life forms and so forth but how could the frog be god I feel like the challenge, like the author, the fiction author's challenge, like is is to communicate God through the particular. But you can never move, go into the transcendental, really. Um, 
or at least the way that Gao write it, like his his aesthetic, uh, really is needs the shading. It needs the the, the the it needs to kind of occur at the limits where self and world blur into a mm. a very uh, kind of chaotic and and, de- and scary place. Like that, that, that's mm. these experiences that he has over and over again of being lost, that existential mm. lostness. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I've been uh, contemplating that today because, because just having a collision with your office in one space. I feel sometimes like the, that, like we're just like the um, particle accelerators, they smash different things together, see what happens, they explode out and they say, oh, we've created this uh, subatomic particle uh, gluon that existed for one one billionth of a second. Uh, there are certain kind of literary like collisions that produce these weird particles um, mm. of meaning or of, of, of at least of a curiosity. I, um, that may, I don't know if that made any sense either, <laughs> or if it, it, helped, it relates to this conversation. But it's, I mean, uh, for me, it relates. It's very interesting when you refer to the book and to the other writer and about the different states and metaphysical and maybe the spiritual experience. Now, for Gao, God to become a frog, he is an artist who has been taken to the um, to the fields to work. And he mentioned it in one of the chapters, so his mind can be reshaped. This is what the state wanted. I feel in the field, this artist, this author, who had believed in the Taoists, in Taoism, in spirituals, in the super metaphysical, whatever, he met frogs who did not answer him. And there he started to say, God is a frog. But still, as a soul, in the state of the snow, the chapter before 81, when there was no serenity, for him, this is heaven. He created the metaphysical experience. Although God is a frog, it doesn't mean me as a human being, even if God for me does not exist. Even if God is a frog saying meaning, meaningless things, which does not really apply when I am taken to a field and I have to work in a field instead of being creating, I can create my snow and And towards the end, he said, I don't know, I don't understand, and I don't know where I am. I am at this moment. But this moment for him, where this realm of heaven. So still there is this, you know, I mean, when you related it to the other side, for people who experience spiritual um, experiences and believing, Even God is a frog, but it doesn't mean me as a human being. I cannot enjoy serenity. I cannot enjoy a state of being, feeling peaceful, of the sound of the snow when there is no sound. This feeling and this, for him, spiritual experience was more important than going to the Taoist and finding a meaning and meeting the frog God. I mean, this is how I felt. Mm -hmm. So whether you pray, whether you go to temples, whether you do meditation, whether you believe in a supernatural, because he said, God told him there's no magic, but still he felt this moment. We still, as human beings, we will continue to experience this moment, regardless whether we seek it through um, lighting a candle, praying to somebody, to something. We will continue to have this moment. And he had it towards I mean, at chapter 80, he had this, uh, chapter 80 was a beautiful chapter. I felt it's like, this is how I want to feel when I die. I mean, it was a beautiful chapter. I don't know. Why don't we look at it? Because I read it just before our call. Let 
Would you read it to us? Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you gasp for breath, taking a step and then resting as you walk towards the mountain of ice. It is a struggle. The green river of ice is dark, but transparent. Huge mineral veins, inky green like jade, lie beneath it. You glide on the smooth ice and the biting cold stings you, your numb, frozen cheeks. Barely visible snowflakes of all colors glisten before your eyes and the moist air you breathe out instantly forms a layer of white frost on your eyebrows. All around is frozen silence. The river bread suddenly rises and the glacier imperceptibly moves a few meters, 10 or so meters or even much more in a year. You are going against the flow of the glacier, crawling like a partially frozen insect. Up ahead in the shadows, where the sunlight doesn't reach. Wind-swept flat slabs of ice soar up. When gale force winds blow at a speed of over 100 meters per second, these white, white walls of ice are polished to a high sheen. You are in the midst of these ice, ice crystal ruins. And even while not moving, you are grasping for air. There is a tearing pain in your lungs and your brain has already frozen so that you can't think. Everything is almost blank. Isn't this precisely the state you have been aspiring to reach? Like this world of ice and snow, there are only some indefinite blurred images created by shadows. They don't tell anything, have no meaning, are a stretch of deathly loneliness. You can fall over with every step, so you fall over then struggle as you slide and crawl. Your hands and feet can no longer feel pain. The snow piled on the ice gradually decreases and is left only in corners where the wind can't reach. The snow is solid. It gives the impression of being soft and fluffy, but is not, but it's in fact wrapped in a hard coating of ice. A bald eagle is circling in the valley of ice below your feet. It is the only other form of life apart from you. You can't decide whether or not it is something you've imagined. But what is important is that you do have visual images. You spiral upwards, and while spiraling up between life and death, you are still struggling. You still exist. This is to say blood is still circulating in your veins. Your life still hasn't ended. In the vast silence, there is a thinking a faint thinking which is barely audible, like ice crystals colliding. You think you hear it. A purple cloud haze appears on the mountain top, showing that the wind storm swirling at high speed. Wisps of cloud on the edges show the force of the wind. The tinkling becomes clearer and causes your heart to palpitate. palpitate. You see a woman riding on a horse. The horse's head on the woman both appear above the snow line, against the background of the gloomy ice raven. You seem also to hear singing accompanying the tinkling of the bells on the horse. Women from Chang'an, hair plated with silk ribbons, jade earrings, silver bracelets, sash of many colors. She seems to be a Tibetan woman you once saw on a horse next to a road marker. Uh, 5,600 feet above sea level on a snow-covered mountain. She was looking back at you and smiling, enticing you to fall into an icy river. At the time, you couldn't help walking towards her. These are all memories. This tinkling which sticks in your mind seems to be a sound in your brain. There is an agonizing, searing pain at your lungs and stomach. Your heart pulsates widely, chaotically, and your brain is about to explode. When it explodes, the blood will clot. It will be a soundless explosion. Life is fragile, yet to abstinently struggle is nature, is natural. You open your eyes, the light hurts. You can't see anything, but you are aware that you are still crawling. 
The tinkling bells have become distant memories, indistinct longings, like sparkling ice flowers, fragmented, ephemeral, glistening on the retina of your eyes. You strive to discern the colors of the rainbow. You swirl around upside down, float backwards, lose the ability to control yourself. It is all futile, striving, vague hope, refusal to be extinguished, pitch black cavern, skeleton's eye sockets, seeming to go deep inside, nothing there at all. A cacophony splits asunder with a blast. I, I never before experienced limpidity, a, total, a totality of purity and freshness. You perceive a barely discernible, subtle, almost soundless sound. It turns transparent, is carded, filtered, clarified. You are falling and while falling, you float up so gently and there is no wind, no physical burdens and no rashness in your emotions. Your whole body is cool. Your body and mind listen intently. Your whole body and mind hear the soundless, blowing music. In your conscious mind, this thread of gossamer becomes smaller, but increasingly clear, appears right before your eyes, delicate, like a strand of hair, and also like a crack of light. The extremity of the crack fuses with the darkness, loses its form, expands, transforms into faint minute points of light, that boundless, countless particles involve enveloping you in this cloud blanket of distinct particles. Minute points of light form clusters, drift into motion, turn into a mist-like nebula, keep slowly transforming, gradually solidifying into a dark moon tinged with blue. The moon within the sun turns gray purple, instantly spreads out, but the center further condenses turns dark red, gives off bright purple rays. You close your eyes to cut the glare, but can't. Trembling fear and hope rise from the depth of your heart. At the edge of the darkness, you hear music. This solidified sound gradually expands, spreads, and sparkling crystals of sound penetrate your body. You can't work out where you are. The particles of bright crystals of sound permeate your body and mind from all directions as a mass of long notes take shape. There is a vigorous middle note. You can't catch the melody, but can perceive the richness of the sound. It links up with another mass of sounds, intermingles, unfolds, turn into a river, which disappears and appears, appears and disappears. A dark blue sun circles within an even darker moon. You hold your breath, Entraptured, stop breathing, reach the extremity of life, but the force of the pul pulsating sounds becomes stronger and stronger, lifts you up, pushes you towards a high tide, a high tide of pure spirituality. Before your eyes, in your heart, in your body, oblivious to time and space, in the continual surge of sustained noise, of reflected images in the dark sun within the dark moon is a blast exploding, 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 explode, 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 ding, 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 ding. Then, I, then again, absolute silence. You fall into an even deeper darkness and again feel your heart puls pulsating, discern physical pain. The fear of death of the living body is concrete, like this. The physical body you failed to abandon recovers its sensitivity. In the darkness, in the corner of the room, the line of bright red lights on your tape recorder is flashing. That's really good writing. <laughs> I really like that. Mm. Thank you for reading that. No problem. It's really pleasurable to listen. Mm. Um, yeah. 
it's like a whole spirit, you know, out of body experience. It seems. Yes. Mm. And then after this experience, he takes us to the frog, meeting the frog. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of why I felt like hmm, there isn't really a story. Um, there's not a traditional or conventional structure, but there is a movement. There is a hmm. logic. Yes, and it's almost more like a river hmm. than um, you know some kind of. Uh, rational order mm. like maybe this this is almost like the, the end of the river this is where the river opens into, mm. into into the sea or becomes uh we start in, with a train right so mm. we, he's on a train journey he meets the you mm. or creates the you mm. uh through their coffee cups or tea cups <laughs> rattling tinkling remember the tinkling mm. maybe there's a tinkling mm. sound actually of the of the tea cups i think because that has come up before and mm. and then we follow him through various villages mountains uh, uh interesting people uh, and then his dialogue with the she, which we mm. haven't talked quite about, but it, it, get, it gets pretty dark in this second half of the book. We, we talked a little bit about it the first time, but it gets, I think, more um, graphic mm. in ways. Uh, but then it does, and that, but then it brings you back, brings us back in the chapters just before this to all the, the people who are visiting him, his various friends. The night out that he has with some group of mm. college girls sounds like mm. <laughs> that, that they look sounded like they had a lot of fun. Uh, he enjoys himself with with various people and with, with certain friends, but the world comes back and it sort of presses in again. Uh, and mm. I think this must be before he leaves uh, the country finally and, mm. and moves into a new life. And I, I remember. Um, him saying that the Tiananmen Square uh, mm. massacre incident, mm. uh, like that was part of the impetus for him to complete the book because he realized he would never go back, that he could not go back. And it took him seven years, I think, to write the book or he was writing it over the course of seven years. And maybe like Doug said, really there was how many thousands of episodes and recordings uh, that he had made and um, bits of poetry or bits of song that he picked up along the way. But at a certain point, he had to complete it. He had to bring it in. He had to resolve it into a work. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, I don't know, like when I read this chapter, and like I said, I read it just before, but you allowed me to experience it um, maybe for the first time actually uh, that there's maybe the that sort of release uh, when you, you realize you're at the end of a, a phase or part of your life or mm. um, uh, that, and, and and he's writing this is he speaking it out loud, perhaps? Is he recording this at the same time? Is he narrating what he's experiencing? Mm -hmm. um, or is he, is that added on as he's practicing, rehearsing his, his experience that he's written down? I don't know exactly what, mm -hmm. what his process is, but there's something that happens there at that moment. That, that mm -hmm. this moment is, is a record of mm -hmm. perhaps a, per a moment in his personal journey. Mm -hmm. where um, it's like a culmination, uh, in, right? And, uh, the exploding and the, the, the like rising out of his body into this pure spiritual light and then mm -hmm. sent back into his 
particularity, his individual particularity. Uh, I find like that that this observation about life that um, he calls it the struggle. The obs- life is fragile, yet yet to mm. obstinately struggle is natural. Mm. That this is what he returns to, and this is what is kind of at the heart of that loneliness, maybe, mm. is uh, the inescapability of the, of the struggle. Because, all right, supermind becomes matter. Why would it do that? What would, if, if it could just remain as pure spiritual light, if it could remain as pure absolute transcendental consciousness without having to you know feel the, the pain of being in a body or of alienation from your friends or your society or of the um it seems like to be like this kind of logic of man women relationships that he's exhausted he can't there's nothing in it for him mm. anymore it's just the there's uh he, he talks about how he can't really love anymore in that mm. personal way, it seems. That's what I think where those relationships kind of resolve after the drama and the, mm. the brinksmanship and uh, the, the, the one woman who claims that he wants to kill her and throw her off the... Mm-hmm. Maybe he does. You know, he, she might mm-hmm. have been perceiving something. Like He runs into all the various women who say men are bad, men are... And... Mm. Um, I think he doesn't disagree with them. I I don't think he, but it also, there seems to be a sort of trap there too. Mm. uh, There's that one woman he has, uh, who comes over to his house a couple of times and she's a, she seems to, she's really almost his superior, you know, intellectually. Mm. She, like, she's more forth coming than than he is do you remember that i don't remember exactly which chapter it is yeah i think at the beginning this is later in the book this is toward, uh, toward the end and it's a, it's a it? it's one of his a friend of a friend uh who comes over a couple of times in two different chapters uh, uh, okay. and seduces him uh, uh yes yes mm-hmm. and uh Yes, I think the one who wants always to turn the light off, right? Yes. Was that uh, that was the woman? Yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. She has a strong character. That's true in comparison with the other she's. Yeah. That's right. Um, mm. But I guess that the, the uh, to get to the metaphysical observation mm. uh, and. Like why the descent into um, into the realm of suffering and loneliness? Um, if that wasn't part of the point, or if that wasn't part of the point, then Supermind could just stay in eternal bliss. So there's some mm. kind of different it's, kind of. It's kind of, but uh, and we might get into this later in some Aurobindo talk, but it's part of maybe the water cycle. There's, I mentioned the river in this particular chapter, everything is frozen. And that's, it's almost like a a hibernation in a way. It's a chance to, or it's his experience of that, that the nothing and everything coming together. And it's, it's just, there it explodes but it's not obliteration it's explosion into particles freezing slowly stopping the vibration of life for a little bit and he realizes that he comes full circle to a certain extent i guess um i was going back to chapter four or five at the end uh, i was looking at the notes my notes and he starts 
um, he, he has a line, I am becoming obsessed with getting to the dreamable forest at the back of the mountain and find myself drawn to it by some inexplicable force. And then he's talking about the, the just this sound that's becoming, the river noise is becoming louder and louder. So it, it's, and there's fog and mist and that's kind of part of the cycle too. So he's frozen in time is when the time of reflection, the river is kind of the journey to experience life and it can become a waterfall. It can become turbulent, um, especially the relationships. Uh, if you're trying to, if you're in a boat in the, in some nasty rapids, then you're going to have troublesome relationships there. But, and then the fog is kind of the mysterious, like where, where does this reside? Where, where is this water? The, the river, I guess. And so, so it's, it's hard, hard to, to say why you can't stay frozen. Um, just simply because we are, we are material. We are, uh, uh, unless even in Antarctica at some point, 10,000 years from now, it might be a completely melted mass um, of water um, and reveal whatever lands underneath, but the ice will be gone at some point and the big scheme of things. But this is not about the book at all. I, I, I didn't really get a chance to read the, the internal structure. I'm going kind of at the outside structure of the novel here. But and I think it I did mention, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause myself here so I can, pause. I'll, I'll probably be in the car driving home because um, I do have no battery. But anyways, I'll be listening in, I hope. Okay. Well, um, I thought actually that was a really nice way of eluc elucidating or fusing, merging the transcendental perspective with the images that Gao uses in the novel, the river, the mist, mm. etc. Because you can imagine transformations of consciousness occurring mm. as like changes in state where the liquid is more earth bound. The water comes down to earth, it sinks into the ground, it forms channels, rivers, it flows uh, with gravity. Uh, and then it solidifies in ice in, in the cold, but the other part of the cycle is the melting and then the evaporation becoming finer and finer, uh, ultimately becoming um, transparent uh, in, in, in the air. And that's kind of the, the state of pure consciousness. It's the state of pure non-duality. Um, maybe that's Satchitananda or that's Supermind or maybe these don't map onto each other that cleanly. Mm. Um, but I, th I think that the other aspect of it is the aesthetic aspect. And you know, if, if there's one thing that an artist does, that a novelist does, is create art in language, create beauty in, in, the, in the particular medium in which he or she works. And for a novelist, it's, it's language. And so I think that in part of maybe, like, what is the book about? Is it about God? Is it about the individual? Is it about society? It's about all of those things. But it's also about, it's just about the, the language itself, what the language itself can do, and the, what it does as we read it. Like when you read that, I experienced something. I experienced my own soul going through these transformations and my own struggle and the way that I feel about, um, about this life uh, process uh, that um, I find myself in. And why do I want to read an author like Gao Jingjian? What does, what does he do? What does he offer me that why am I not, uh, you know, out making money or doing, you know, something more productive, uh, something um, more util utilitarian? Um, I think it's because he reflects this truth of what it means to be a human being, uh, at least a certain kind of human being. Like, not everybody um, 
identifies as an artist or you know really lets themselves be as lonely as uh, an artist sometimes has to be in order to do their work in order to follow the the thread of meaning in the flow of experience the flux of experience um i find although i didn't i didn't like rushing through the last 80 pages because most of the time i've read this book i've let myself be a little more in the same state the more timeless state the dreaming the dream state and and i found that when i when i did that i really could appreciate the aesthetic beauty of the of the of the language and i'll just say too i mean this is a obviously a translation from the chinese but it, in english it is a beautiful book mm. i i have no idea what it's like in chinese but it it and it sounds beautiful in arabic as well <laughs> and so it is its own justification it doesn't have to mean anything beyond itself um and i am glad that we are setting aside time and made time to to let it be what it is and let ourselves experience it it's not easy some in the flux of modern life to mm-hmm. make time for literature um but i feel like it's worthwhile that we do when we do yeah that's true that's true as you said i mean it doesn't have to have meaning outside itself i mean this is the new its universe and its meaning is only there you don't have to go and look for meaning i mean just experiencing it chapter after chapter is the meaning of it i mean this is how i felt because if you give it to anybody maybe who is used to the traditional way of writing as you said at the beginning the plot the rising action the climax and then the falling action and a protagon- protagonist uh, and uh, anti protagonist they he or she might not like it but i mean for me it was not just a book it was an experience and uh, this is the beauty of art i mean you go and see a painting and even if it doesn't have meaning but the experience it gives you i mean sometimes there are certain paintings that trigger something inside you and it has meaning for you individually and it doesn't have to have meaning for many people and for me yeah this book i mean i might go back and read it again uh yeah i i feel i need to go back and read it again and it's created meaning for me and it did not create meaning <laughs> at the same time and as you said maybe this is life i mean still we have to struggle and to live it and whether there is a meaning or not but for a person like for gao living in china and what he experienced is really what led him to say there's no meaning i mean if you live in modern city you wake up every morning you go to a job you get paid you think there is meaning but if you are taken suddenly from this false meaning thrown in a field asked to do something you don't know how would you then come back from that field and say yeah there is meaning in life maybe this is what we have to ask ourselves i mean we all experience certain things in life when you think that there is meaning in what you do you wake up in the morning you have family you have kids you have parents you have friends you think this is real meaning but then again what if this all changed like what happened to him would you really still say there is meaning i don't think so i mean I some I I do understand I mean when he say there is no meaning because I always say there is no meaning <laughs> definitely there is no meaning we try to believe there is meaning but I don't think so you wake up that the the important question 
the Shakespearean question every day is, what will I have for dinner? Maybe this is the most important, meaningful question in your life. But the rest of the day, there's no meaning. I mean, this is how I see it. I you go know. on. <laughs> I go on. You- because I... Exactly, because I tell you why I go on. Because I failed to abandon the body. <laughs> as he said. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know. This is how, this is how I experienced the book for me. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I enjoyed our conversation, and yeah. I don't know if it meant anything. No, definitely. <laughs> it had a meaning. <laughs> I think it was its own justification, actually. Um, why don't we uh, read another book at some point? I I, uh, I don't want to – let's talk about it by on the forum and mm-hmm. see what comes up next. Yes. I want to make sure why? that I have the time. I want to give it the time it needs. Mm. And, Mm. Um, allow maybe just to allow different. Mm. I don't want to rush. Uh, yes, we give ourselves some time with this book too. I know mm. I had I've had a lot going on over the past mm. months mm. I got mm. sick for a while, and I had to re-evaluate mm. what I could really do um, with my energy because I, I didn't have as much, and I feel like I'm gaining more now um and i want i i i'm also um in this in a place where i want to write a lot more and i i feel like i'm i'm gathering energy or i'm gathering bits of kind of useful information or useful tools or points of view like everything that i read everything that we discuss i'm sort of there's a part of me that's just taking it in, waiting and waiting and waiting mm-hmm. because I want to re-create um, it in a way. I, I want to bring it into my own my own writing, although not. I don't know in what way. It's not. Mm. It looked nothing like anything that I've we've read or discussed. But for me, this is very important as part of my process as a writer is mm-hmm. to um, be in a relationship with books be in a relationship with other authors and be trying to understand what they're saying and what their, what their experiences and why they portray it in the way that they do, why they write it in the way that they do, because that seems to give me ideas and clues about how I could do the same in my own case. Like Mm. uh, everything in my life will change too. My girls are outside playing in the yard (laughs) right now. Uh, and they're in the flower of their lives, like they're <laughs> pure joy, really. Uh, no care, that, barely any cares. They don't have to struggle. They don't have to. They're not always happy, of course. They, they fight. They get hungry. They get tired, and so on. But they're in this phase of life that is, in a way, pure innocence, and that will change, right? <laughs> Everything will change. So, what does it mean? What am I, does it, does it lead to something else that is the point? The, the, the long, I, perhaps at times I think or I hope it does or I'm waiting for that to occur, but it doesn't actually occur. It doesn't lead <laughs> to something else. It's always just what is happening at the moment. And I'm either mm-hmm. with it and paying attention and noticing it and appreciating it or interacting with it or, uh, playing whatever, like I'm either there or I'm not. And mm. well, it's not either or. I mean, there's sometimes just degrees, right? But um, I think with fiction and like what a book like this for me attunes me to the attention to the particularity of experience and the depth of that particularity because each moment has these deep roots. And if you follow them down, you ask the questions, if you kind of go beyond mm. the patterns and the rhythm, the, the, the more unconscious kind of patterns of your life, then you suddenly discover what's really there. 
and and that I think is is all, is all, is artistic and that's poetic. You find mm-hmm. that you find that's beautiful. You find what's worth writing down because all this he had to write down. He had to take the moment in time in consciousness to write it down to think about the word, the language to maybe he may have rehearsed it mm. many, many times to, to, so that it would feel right. And so that it would be right according to him. And the time it takes to do that, the investment that one makes in, in that nobody may see that nobody may mm. really, um, applaud you for doing mm. that. You may not receive a Nobel prize. Uh, you, and 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 still that that is how one um goes one lives one goes on uh, it's it's one way of living i think uh, that's what how he describes art it's a path of life it's not everybody's path exactly mm. generally maybe but um it heartens me that there are others <laughs> who have, um, you know, who do it, and uh, uh, and that we can talk, and we have this mm-hmm. trans temporal, trans spatial uh, conversation. I think that that's that's um, it's a good thing to do. I'm glad we're doing it. So I hope we can continue. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd like to make just one quick, two maybe two comments, but. Um, what you said just a little bit ago, Donna, really, really sounded poetic. And uh, I mean, if you go back and look at this uh, video, you might want to uh, have it as a <laughs> something you actually <laughs> write down. But um, yeah, that it's just kind of a freedom from that known life, even even if there's no meaning. Meaning, but once you reach that meaninglessness, and it's it's not nihilistic as as gao says at one point mm. it, it has elements of it but it, it i feel it gives you a freedom to escape that that feeling that path that so many unconscious beings reside in like right now i'm i'm driving <laughs> in my car or well not anymore i parked but <laughs> i'm on my way back to work and um it's just I, I I'm in the midst of that that life that I don't want to leave in a certain sense but at the same time I I'm completely free um, I have all my moments gathering up right now um, and something Marco was, he's trying to have me become a writer or at least I, I joined the, one of the writers underground groups um, just to kind of listen listen in be a, a an outside observer um maybe possibly give advice or not give advice but say oh this works this doesn't type thing um and a few are saying well why don't you just go ahead and try try out becoming a writer and i i can hear in both of your your voices the sense of writing uh, and see it in so many others but but i i, I keep coming back to this why write why it's it's pointless it's meaningless and this at least this conversation right here is kind of giving me some sort of some sort of hope (laughs) so so thank you tana would you like to to join us in any of those we just have a forum channel where we could share Mm -hmm. writing that we're working on it's not necessarily for publication it's Mm -hmm. it's more Mm -hmm. just to share and and we've been meeting once a month to look at a person's writing and give feedback on mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, I c- if you're interested, I could just add you to the group and whenever something comes up, mm-hmm. if you, want mm-hmm. to, you, you can get involved. Um, yes. It's yeah, yes, okay. that would, that, that would be great. I think everyone mm-hmm. would welcome that too. And, uh-huh. <laughs> um, like we're all working on it mm. we're working on our own work. <laughs> and so to have a, just a space for feedback, mm. for reflection mm-hmm. and for reception, uh, has been has been helpful so far, uh, mm-hmm. so I'll do that. And, yeah. Um, 
and then let's see what we read next. I, you know, uh, well, let's let's come back. Let's have another conversation. I don't want to think about it too much. <laughs> uh, Doug yeah. mentioned Point Omega by Don DeLillo. That mm. I already read that. Yeah. I actually would. Mm. A wonderful writer. Uh, it's a short book. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to read some poetry too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd love to read poetry as well. I was thinking of doing like a just a night of only poetry where. You bring something. Everyone brings a poem. Doesn't it? Not mm. something you doesn't have mm. to be something you wrote. Could be mm. just something that's yeah, yeah. you in the moment, and and we share it, read it, reflect. or a poet. I mean, right? Yeah, I, I I can share with you poems, Arabic poems. I mean, yeah. if you're interested, I can translate them. I mean, I can read in Arabic and translate for you. If you're interested, I can do that. Certainly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We have um, an Iraqi uh, poet from the 50s. He was very much uh, influenced by T.S. Eliot. He has really some beautiful free verse poems. So maybe, What's why not? What's his name? Bad Badr Shakir Asayab. 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 Okay. He has a poem. It's called uh, Matar, Matar, Matar. It's basically the same. Yeah, it's basically um, completely the same like the wasteland. Mm -hmm. Matar in English in English is rain. It's called rain, rain, rain. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's that'd basically a journey like the wasteland, T. S. Eliot's wasteland. Mm -hmm. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's, let's that's in the space we've planted the seed. Yeah. Let's. Uh, we'll come. We have time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We will create time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. Yeah, and looking forward to our next book. Let me know what's going to be the next book. If you like me to suggest more novels, okay. also, please, yeah, I'll yeah. be happy. <laughs> okay, all right, good. All right, good. thank you, and thank you okay. for suggest you suggested this novel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you. That was all right. Was it has been a great experience, and thank you so much. I mean, okay. for all your uh, remarks, it was very interesting reading. <laughs> yes, you as well. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.